quantum diagram, diagram reasoning. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so first I want to thank the organizers for this, uh, this workshop, this nice workshop, thank you, and for also the organization of this semester. Very interesting. So today I want to talk about um, diagrammatic reasoning, and uh, we have heard already uh, about uh, this. Uh, we have seen several talks about diagrammatic reasonings, about string diagrams, networks, uh, hypergraph categories, higher categories, and uh, operads, and probably others talks that I'm missing. So I want to talk about this kind of uh, graphical language, but in particular in the case of quantum mechanics and quantum information uh, processing, quantum computing. And the question that I want to address here is the completeness of this kind of languages. That is, if you have a graphical language which is complete, it means that you can just forget all the other formalisms that you can have. So, for instance, in a quantum case, you can just forget matrices, Hilbert spaces, and all these kind of complicated things, and just work with a simple, intuitive, uh, graphical language. Oh, that, would, that would be great, right? And um, so, if it is complete. Now, if it is incomplete, it means that there are some properties of quantum mechanics that you are not capturing with your language. So it means that there is some room for improvement. You can try to find some new rules, some new uh, structures which are satisfied by quantum mechanics. So in fact, it's also uh, exciting to, to, to find a, an incompleteness result. But it turns out that this is a hard question in general, and uh, often we just don't know, oops, we just don't know if the language is complete or not. So today I want to show you some new results, in fact some new results of incompleteness. And this is a joint work with uh, Emmanuel Jandel, Renaud Villemar and Harney Wang. Okay, so what's the context? So I'm going to use the ZX calculus, which is this uh, graphical language introduced by Bob Kuke and Ross Duncan. And we had a, a nice talk yesterday about the introduction about this language, an introduction on this language. Uh, so we have this kind of diagrams with uh, inputs on the top and outputs on the bottom. This is the pessimistic point of view. And we have two kinds of dots, green dots, red dots, with, uh, which are parameterized by an angle. And if there is no angle, it means that this angle is just zero. So this is um, a nice graphical language with a wide uh, spectrum of applications from foundations of quantum mechanics, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, spatial dagger Frobenius algebras are capturing the notion of autonomous bases, or that uh, of algebras are capturing the notion of complementarity, that is the uncertainty principle, essentially. We have this kind of results, moreover, we have seen Julio using this kind of, uh, not exactly this one, but this kind of graphical diagrams to, graphical language to, um, talk about the axiomatization of quantum mechanics and actually even more general theories. So there are some uh, foundations applications, but this language also aims to be a practical tool for quantum information processing. <coughs> With this language, you can actually prove protocols, you can use this language to develop error correcting codes, and actually Dominique Osman is uh, actually uh, using the ZX calculus in order to develop some new error correcting codes for the practical quantum computer. So he's developing error correcting codes which are uh, working with uh, a limited memory and uh, which are uh, very efficient. And this language is coming with a software, Quantumatic, that you can use to uh, describe this kind of diagrams and reason on, this, uh, on these diagrams, right? So if you're interested, you can have a look to this, uh, this page. And actually, we have seen Quantumatic in action yesterday during Ross's talk. OK, so this uh, language is used to represent quantum evolutions. And this is actually a universal language. You can represent any quantum evolution using this language. So how does it work? Each qubit is representing, sorry, each wire is representing a qubit. <laughs> And, um, and uh, well, so, okay, so there is a limitation actually, since each wire is representing a qubit, what you can represent with a finite diagram is a finite qubit quantum evolution. Okay, so that's why this language is universal for finite qubit quantum mechanics. Um, so if you want to know what is the quantum evolution, which is represented by this diagram, you can compute the semantics, that is a, a matrix describing the quantum evolution. 
And in order to know what is the matrix, you cut your diagram into pieces. And uh, you can just decompose the, the diagram like this. And then you have a look to uh, the semantics of the language for each basic element. And like this, you can compute the matrix associated with this diagram. Okay, so this is the semantics <coughs> of the language. Okay. Okay, so this language is coming with some rules to transform the diagrams. So for instance, we have the spider, which tells you that whenever you have two green dots which are connected, you can merge them and you add the angles. You have some other equation saying that when you have a, a green dot with, of degree two with just two legs, you can just remove this dot, for instance. You have the same rules for the red dots. And you have some other rules for the interactions between the green dots and the red dots, like this. <coughs> and actually, these, these, these rules are now well understood. Actually, these kind of equations on the top correspond to the fact that we are working with a special dagger for Venus algebra. So as I said before, it captures the notion of autonomous bases. This is a result by Jamie and Bob and Bob Cooke and Dusko Pavlovic. And uh, so this one here corresponds to the fact that we have Hopf algebras, and uh, it captures the notion of complementarity of the bases. Um, well, just a remark, in general, in Hopf algebra, we don't have this, uh, these kind of things. So here, this diagram with no input and no output is actually a, a scalar, just a complex number. So here, the Bal algebra, which this is called Bal algebra, so we have the usual Bal algebra up to a normalization here. And this diagram here, the normalization is actually root 2. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we have a good understanding of these kind of rules, right? It points out interesting structures in quantum mechanics. But it turns out that this is, these rules are not enough to capture all the properties of qubit quantum mechanics. We need some additional rules. So for instance, we need this rule, which is about uh, scalars, so about diagrams with no input and no output. And uh, so here, the interpretation of this diagram, which is the empty diagram, so it's representing just the, the scalar one, the complex number one. So here, this rule tells us that here, actually, this diagram is the inverse of this one, right? And since I said that this one is root two, this one is one over root two. We have other axioms like this one. So this one, actually, this uh, scalar is interesting because it's zero. It's how you encode the scalar zero. And here, it's uh, the absorbing property of, of the zero. And you have other axioms for um, angles, pi commutation, and these kind of things. There are a few other axioms, but here you have a representative set of, uh, of the axioms of the language. Okay, so we have this, this language, and the question is, is it complete? That is, do we have all the possible rules? Can we prove everything using these rules or, or not? So the completeness formally means that if you take two diagrams, D1 and D2, which are representing the same matrix, so the same quantum evolution, is it actually possible to prove using the rules of the language that D1 is equal to D2? This is the completeness property. OK, so there is a, a series of results about the completeness of the ZX calculus. So the first result I want to show you is a negative result. This is a result by Vladimir Zemziev and Christian Schroeder. They showed that actually ZX calculus is not complete. Some equations that are not provable with this language. And uh, the bad news is that actually there is uh, no obvious way to extend the language, to complete the language, or at least to try to add some new equation to the language. OK, so the entire language is not complete. But now, if you just consider a sub-language, and this is uh, what Miriam Bacons did, so she considered the pi by 2 fragment of the language, which consists in considering only the diagrams where the angles are multiple of pi by 2. Okay? So you have this restriction on the angles. And it turns out that she proved that it's complete. For this fragment, the language is complete. So that's, uh, that's an interesting result. 
And, uh, but here the bad news is that actually this is probably too restrictive and we lose the universality of the language. That is, there are some quantum evolutions that cannot be represented in this fragment. They cannot even be approximated with this fragment. And uh, actually, for instance, if you have a quantum algorithm which is described in this fragment, it turns out that this quantum algorithm can be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. So for quantum computing, this is not what you want to, to do, right? So we need something more, more expressive. <coughs> and the interesting fragment is actually the pi by four fragment. So you restrict the angles to be multiple of pi by four, yes? It's really not clear to me how the full thing is not complete, here. the fragment is complete, how does that work? Well, it means that actually, okay, so for the proof of incompleteness, it's constructive. So there is a pair of diagrams which are representing the same matrix, and it turns out that you cannot prove that they are equal. But it turns out that in this particular example, the angles here are not multiple of pi by two. So when you restrict the angles, you are just, uh, this, this counterexample doesn't work. Okay, so that's how you can uh, get the completeness. Okay so, okay, so the pi by four fragment, this is what you want to work with because this fragment is uh, universal. Any quantum evolution can be approximated uh, by a diagram in this fragment. And there are some notions of efficiency, so this is really what you want to work with. And uh, so Miriam Beckens, again, managed to prove the completeness of this fragment, but with a very strong assumption, which is that the diagram uh, all the dots are of degree at most two. Okay, so it means that essentially the diagram you are working with are just path from the inputs to the output, so it's just local operations. So it's very restrictive, but at least, at least it's, it's complete for this, this particular case. Okay, but for the pi by four fragment in general, <coughs> it turns out that it's incomplete, and here is the candidate for the incompleteness. In fact, the, the candidate is the a property which has been pointed out by Bob Cooker and Bill Edwards, which is called supplementarity. Uh, if you take this diagram, so, with, uh, so you have a red dot and these two green dots and the angle are, there is antiphase here, you have alpha, alpha plus pi. They are connected together, you can actually merge them. Okay, you can fold this, uh, this diagram into this one where the angle is the sum of the two angles. Okay, and so if you look at the matrices, it turns out that for any alpha, this is true. The two matrices are the same. But is it provable in the language, right? This is the, the candidate for the incompleteness. And we proved recently with Arnie Wang that actually, no, you cannot prove this, uh, this equation. As soon as the angle is not a multiple of pi by two, there is no way to prove this uh, supplementarity using the rules of the language, of the ZX calculus. Okay, so we need this con condition because when alpha is a multiple of pi by two, we know that it's complete, okay? So it's provable when alpha is pi by two, but when alpha is pi by four, it's not provable, so it proves that the pi by four fragment is not complete. Okay, but, uh, okay, so now the idea is that we have identified this equation which is not provable in the language, so let's add this new equation, the supplementarity, to the language. And now we consider ZX calculus plus the supplementarity, and we wonder if this language is complete. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some new results about uh, this, uh, this completeness, and the answer is no, it's not complete. And I'm going to show you several examples, actually an infinity plus one counterexample. Okay, so let me start with the one, okay? It's a little bit easier. So this is the, the, the example. So here we have a, so yeah, complete for the pi by four fragment, I should have said here or in general. So here we are in the pi by four fragment, we have this diagram, and if you compute the semantics of this uh, scalar, it turns out that it's one, so it's the same as the empty diagram. And I claim that we cannot prove this equation in the ZX calculus. And actually the proof is uh, simple, so I'm going to show you the proof. It's based on an invariant, and this invariant is the following. Given a diagram, we compute this quantity, 
which is the parity of the number of green legs, so the degree of the green dots. So in your diagram, you consider all the green dots and you sum the degree of these green dots, so the number of inputs, outputs of these green dots. And you take it modulo two. So it's a parity of the number of green legs. And it turns out that if you take uh, this language, ZX calculus and the supplementarity rule, it turns out that all the axioms of the language are satisfying this invariant. And actually, it's not an accident because in the pi by two fragment, this, uh, this uh, invariant must be satisfied. So it's uh, not uh, an accident, right? So it's satisfied, and here it's easy to uh, compute this invariant. On this side, we have just one green dot, which is of degree one, so it's one. And on the other side, there is nothing, so it's zero. So the invariant is not satisfied for this particular rule, so it means that you cannot prove it uh, using the ZX calculus. Okay, so we have identified a new rule. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to use some notation for the talk. I've talked about the supplementarity, but this rule, so I'm going to add these uh, two axioms to the ZX calculus and call it ZX prime, okay? And uh, just a remark, so by doing this, we are increasing the power of the language, but we are also increasing the number of axioms, but actually, two axioms of the ZX calculus can actually be derived if you have these new rules. So instead of adding new axiom, we can just replace these two axioms here by these two new axioms, and we get a language which is more expensive, more expressive, but uh, without increasing the number of axioms. Okay. Okay, so I said that um, I'm going to show you an infinite number of uh, counterexamples. So here are the candidates for uh, the, the incompleteness, and in fact, it's based on a generalization of the supplementarity. So here it's the supplementarity, I remind you. So when you have this, this kind of green dots, you can merge them together. And it turns out that we can generalize it if we have now three branches, three dots, with where the angles are alpha, alpha plus two pi by three, alpha plus four pi by three. We can also merge them, okay? It also works. If you look at the matrices, it's, they are representing the same matrix, and so on. Four branches, it's also working, and so on. N branches, it's also working, right? So, um, okay, so just a remark about the angles that you have here in the green dots. Actually, it's, they should be uniformly distributed on the circle, on the unit circle, so it should remind you the roots of unity, okay? Something like this. So the distance between two green dots should be the same, okay? It's, uh, the angle is always two pi by N in two consecutive dots. Okay, so we have some candidates here, but is it actually the case that we cannot prove uh, this using the ZX calculus? Let's take an example. If I use the, uh, if I consider, so the supplementarity with four branches, so this is this one, alpha, alpha plus pi by two, alpha plus pi, alpha plus three pi by two. Here it turns out that we have alpha and alpha plus pi. So for these two dots, I can apply the supplementarity, the usual, the simple supplementarity with two dots, right? So I can take this one and this one and merge them into a single one. And I can do the same with the, these two, with alpha plus pi by two, alpha plus three pi by two, I can also merge them. And actually, I not give you the, all the details of the proof, but you can continue like this, and at the end of the day, you manage to prove that it's actually uh, this equal to this one. Okay, so this one is not a counterexample. Four branches is not a counterexample. Using supplementarity with two, branch, you, two branches, you can prove the supplementarity with four branches. Okay, so what is the structure here? Actually, it's the following. That is, if you, in the ZX prime, if you assume that you have the supplementarity with N branches and the supplementarity with M branches, you are able to prove supplementarity with N times M branches. So we have a structure here. They are not independent somehow, all these properties. And we have the following structure. Okay. So since we have these kind of structures, the interesting case are the prime numbers. Okay. Because if the number is not prime, you can decompose it and prove it with smaller cases. And it turns out that for prime numbers, if you take p odd prime number, 
there is no way to prove the supplementarity with p branches. And actually, we are proving that even if you consider that you have the supplementarity with q branches for any prime number q different from p, it's not possible to prove the supplementarity with p. So supplementarity with p branches is a counterexample to, uh, to the, the, the completeness of the language. So here we have an infinite number of counterexamples, and they are all independent. Right? If you assume some of them, you cannot prove the others. OK, so to sum up, we have introduced two new and necessary uh, rules for the ZX calculus. So this generalized supplementarity and this pi by 4 rule. It turns out that uh, the language is still not complete. Uh, the Vladimir's proof does not work directly, but you can patch it and actually prove that even if you have these two new equations, the language is not complete. So what is the future work? Well, um, one point is to try to find a, a meaning, some more insights about this new rule, because we have this new rule. OK, we know that it's, uh, we need this kind of rule. But what is the meaning? Is there a physical meaning for this kind of things? Is there, can we represent it in a categorical way? Is there, there are some structures behind this. I don't know. Uh, another point is um, that Actually, here we have a schema of, of rules with uh, this parameter n. And actually, when n is increasing, this, uh, this rule is becoming very large. That is, in order to apply this, this rule for a parameter n, it means that you have to find in your diagram n dots which are satisfying these conditions. Okay? So somehow it's uh, unbounded. Okay? So is there an alternative uh, set of rules which are bounded, acting on at most five dots or something like that? Um, a question which is related to this one is the implementation of this kind of rule, the generalized supplementarity in quantumatic. It seems that it's not obvious to implement this kind of rules in quantumatic because it's more general than the previous ones. And again, the the, this general question about the completeness of the pi by 4 fragment. Is it enough to add this, this equation to make the language complete for the pi by 4 fragment? We don't know. It's still open. OK. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Is semantic equality of diagram, say, with rational, with fractions of pi, decidable? It seems you could. Is it even recursively enumerable? Well, I was, well, well OK, but I mean, um, let's start with decidable. Because I was actually thinking it might be by an argument about translation into uh, um, uh, arithmetic. Oh, sorry, the real numbers. So, uh, what do you mean? A, a way to prove the, the, the incompleteness, for instance, or just no, for I mean, these particular cases? About, we have a semantics for any two diagrams. So we yeah. have an algorithm where we have a, a problem. Uh, given two diagrams, decide if they're equal, separate from any issue of axiomatization. I'm just wondering if that equality is decidable. And let's say with just with rational with sort of fractions of pi. Yes, yeah. So yeah, in that case, um, because um, there might be a translation. I don't know. <coughs> is decidable in the pi, uh, pi over two case? So Miri in uh, Bacon's paper, she describes. Yes, yes the but there should procedure. be a more general thing. But uh, I mean, there, there, there's normal form. Not the equal, not the equality. So here we are not talking about completeness, right? It's just uh, to decide whether it's provable or not, yes. right? Well, it's uh, whether it's true, whether it's true or not. But no, but it's, it's true language. according to the axioms of the language, not, uh, not about the... No, no, the no, 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 forget, no, 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 just forget the axioms. Are they we're just talking about the semantics. You can okay. translate any diagram into a matrix. So we're asking, uh, given two diagrams, um, can I decide if the matrices are equal? I don't know. You can compute the, the matrices and see if they're the same. Yes, but uh, yes, but to compute it, you need to the representation of the the angles and so on. Just a comment. So, just, just to answer this, uh, so uh, the, the 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 matrix is going to be uh, exponential in the size of the diagram, potentially, not necessarily, but potentially. Uh, so, well, so the complexity is probably. 
Yeah, it, one would expect it to be high, but there should be a translation yeah. into uh, the uh, theory of the real closed field. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked at this. Uh, yeah. You can always compute a matrix that will die. Yes, but it depends on the encoding of the angles and so on, maybe, and uh, so. Yeah, well, you can represent the angles. You can get, you can compute the matrix. Okay. I mean, for for a model of uh, some situation that's not exactly similar, exactly the same, but is uh, some philosophical uh, uh, relation. Uh, back in the uh, 70s. Um, there was uh, the question of uh, completeness or incompleteness of certain logics of programs was posed. And the problem there was that you were working with a few rules, with some simple objects and so on, but everything was happening on top of, say, the theory of natural numbers. So the whole thing would become trivially, you know, you would fall in, in Gödel's uh, infinite pit of uh, <laughs> if you just encoded everything uh, in natural numbers. However, if you look at that work, there is a concept of relative completeness, mm -hmm. relative incompleteness, that could be p possibly something similar can be devised here. So you can isolate this nice set of maybe finite set of simple manipulation rules from the more complicated mathematical semantics that's underneath. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, sense.